BFA admissions. Um, so thanks again for joining me. I've been with our team for about seven years now. Um, so I have a lot of insights to share with you. I'm very excited. Um, so today we'll spend about an hour talking about the application process and I will leave plenty, plenty of time for your questions as well at the end. So as we move through the presentation, please feel free to submit those questions. You can use the chat feature, you can use the Q&A feature. I will look at both and address them at the end. So feel free to chat them in as you think of them. I don't want you to forget um, and I'll get to those at the end. So let's get started. Um, and yeah, thanks for joining. All right, so first of all, let's back up. So an introduction. So with this application workshop today, I hope to provide you insight into and demystify how the admissions committee evaluates each piece of the application. So we'll give you tips for each piece. Um, and with that information in mind, help you prepare your application for round one or the future rounds um, when you apply. So we'll talk about the holistic application review process. So we talk about how we review each application holistically. We'll look at the qualitative and quantitative approach to the application review. We'll dig in deeper into each of the application components and the review process for each. And finally, give you more opportunities to connect with us. All right, so first of all, so the application journey, so it's certainly a journey um, starting now and moving all the way through when you submit your deposit um, and commit to a school. So through our experience, we work really hard to better understand the admissions process from your point of view so that we can continue to find ways to help you through it. Um, certainly there are highs to the process. Uh, you know, the exciting part is definitely talking to students, visiting campus, learning about the schools, and there are frustrating parts, maybe uh, getting recommendations, taking the GMAT or GRE. Uh, usually that's not people's favorite part of the process, but our job is to give you resources and help you through it, answer those questions. Um, we're here to help you, we're excited to help you. We're always really excited at the beginning of every new year to meet all of you and answer your questions. So please use us as a resource, um, let us help you as you move through this process. We understand that finding this fit, finding the right program for you can be long. So really do, we wanna celebrate with you when you submit your application. We wanna be there for you. So please, please reach out to us. So when you're looking at schools and you're establishing what's important to you in an MBA program, definitely also consider reaching out to our MBA student ambassadors. They're a great resource for you to talk to you about the um, steps they took during their application journey, um, their perspective of the school from the student size as well. So let's talk about the holistic application review process. So the admissions committee takes a holistic approach to the application review process, meaning there is no one aspect that will make or break your application. So with each piece of the application, we learn more about your academic history, your professional accomplishments, your goals, and your personal fit with the program. We take all of these elements into consideration as we assess whether you can handle the rigor of the Georgetown MBA program and if our program is the right fit for you. The pieces of your application can be divided into two primary dimensions. So there's the quantitative, the numbers of your application, and also the qualitative or the more personal aspects of your application. So we'll start by looking at the quantitative aspects. So including your academic history as evidenced through your undergraduate GPA, uh, your quantitative coursework as well through your undergraduate or maybe master's work, your GMAT or GRE, your English proficiency exam um, if you are an international student, and your years of full-time work experience post undergraduate. So all of these items together help us see if you can handle the rigor of the program. So first we're going to dive in. So looking at the academic history portion of your application. So your application history, please remember, it's much more than your cumulative GPA. So that's one number that we're looking at certainly, but within that there's a big uh, story to it. So we're certainly looking at upward trends in your GPA per semester. Um, if you started off rocking your undergraduate, you're certainly not alone in that. So we're really looking at the trends. We're looking at what you accomplished over those four years or um, possibly more. We're looking at your quantitative successes. So we do actually have you list out your quantitative coursework on the application because those are important to make sure you can handle the quantitative rigor of the program. We're looking at the strength of your undergraduate institution and considering your major as well to determine, again, if you can handle the coursework at Georgetown. Certainly not all majors and classes are created equal, so we do take that into consideration. Again, like I mentioned, your GPA is not evaluated in isolation. So we're looking at the course load you took during each semester. Again, your major, the types of classes, and certainly considering other demands that were on your time as well. So if you were working full time while you completed your undergraduate, definitely let us know. 
If you were really involved in extracurricular activities, again, you're not alone. So definitely let, let us know that as well. If you had a tough semester or a class, or maybe your GPA isn't where you want it to be, include an explanation about it in your optional essay. So that optional essay is really a chance to share if something was happening in your life that impacted your academic performance and show us how you've learned and grown from that experience. So definitely you don't have to use it, but if you think it would help explain something in your undergraduate history or any other piece of your application, it's definitely there as a resource for you. Another thing we take into consideration when we're looking at your undergraduate performance is how long ago you completed your coursework. So the longer it's been since you've graduated, the more we look at other indicators, such as your work experience, to demonstrate the value you can add to the classroom conversation. Something we often hear from applicants is that they're worried that they don't have a business background. They're worried about that non-traditional background, but definitely you're not alone in that. So 30% 30, 30 of our applicants actually have a business degree, which means 70% are coming from different backgrounds. So we really welcome that. You're not alone in that. And in that case, some applicants do choose to take additional quantitative classes or business classes to boost their credentials. If maybe um, you only had one undergraduate coursework um, class that was a quantitative class. So we definitely see that. There are a lot of great online resources. Um, some of the Coursera classes, some of those are free. So there are a lot of good options out there. If you didn't have quantitative uh, exposure in your undergraduate, definitely highlight that in other ways. So there's other classes you can take, highlight what you have in your work experience and show us that in other ways um, outside of your undergraduate background. So moving on, let's talk about your test scores. So certainly we always get a lot of questions about this. So test scores assess your ability to handle the rigor of coursework with a specific focus on your quantitative abilities. So again, the key thing to remember here, it's one piece to your application. So they certainly matter, but they're only one data point. Both tests, the GMAT and the GRE, are weighted equally. Uh, we do not have a preference, so please take the test that feels more comfortable for you. So if you're taking a practice test and you're doing better with the GRE, that's great. We're definitely seeing a lot more people taking the GRE. Um, you've got 44% of our applicants there have taken it, um, both with full-time and flex. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people take it, so there's certainly no concern with that. Take the test that you feel more comfortable with. We don't have minimum requirements. We have the range listed on our profile. Um, so do keep in mind, some people are going to fall below that range and some people will fall above it. Make sure you prepare each time you take the exam. So we'll put an emphasis on your highest score. Most classes, uh, excuse me, most schools do the same. But we do have access to all of your scores from the past five years. So we do recommend um, taking it once. You'll statistically do better the second time. You'll be more prepared and kind of know what to expect. But definitely prepare each time. So when we're looking at your test scores, what we're looking at is a quantitative score in conjunction with your academic background, again, to make sure that we're setting you up for success in the classroom. If you do speak English as a second language, we'll look at the verbal section as well, the writing, again, to make sure you can handle the coursework. If you are taking the GRE, so ETS offers a really great online conversion tool, so you can convert your tool, or excuse me, convert your GRE into a GMAT score, and you can then compare your score to the range listed on the class profile. So that's a great tool. It's free. It's online. Um, definitely check that out if you're taking the GRE. In terms of the English proficiency exam, so all non-U.S. Um, permanent residents or non-native English speakers are required to submit a current English proficiency exam score. You're exempted from this requirement if you earned your four-year academic degree or advanced degree from an institution in the United States or from a country where the official language is English. So all you have to do to be exempt from that is show us documentation of the language of instruction at your institution. You'll log that, um, actually import that into your application so you don't have to get any approval from us. Just submit that documentation and we'll take it from there. If you do have to take the exam, um, we are looking for a strong score. We do have the um, ranges on our app on our website. Um, it's important for your success in the classroom and your career search as well. So that's why we do put an emphasis on that. So moving on, so we've got your years of work experience. So when evaluating the quantity of your professional experience, we are considering your full-time paid experience after earning your undergraduate degree. So make sure it's clear on your resume, the month and years you held each previous position, no any internships or part-time work. We want to make sure it's very clear um, which work was the full-time paid work on your resume. 
Um, if there are any gaps on your resume um, or you're not currently employed, do give the, give the admissions committee more information about what you were do doing during that time. Use the optional essay um, so we're not kept guessing. So if you do have a gap, if there is anything going on, make sure it's either clear on your resume what you were doing or you use that optional essay to explain the situation. When we're looking at your resume, we do like to see the progression. So if you've been promoted at your company, make sure you include all positions, again, clearly showing us that you've been promoted so we can see the impact and that progression you've had throughout your company. Okay, so with that, so we'll move on to the qualitative section of your application, so the more personal components. So these components include the quality of your professional work experience, your essays, the interview, and the recommendation. So these components all together, they tell us if the Georgetown MBA is the best fit for you. So let's dive deeper. So first of all, we have the letter of recommendation. So the recommendation provides insight into you as a professional. So professional recommendations from the current or previous supervisor are, uh, are really required. Um, if you cannot have your current supervisor um, submit your recommendation, a previous supervisor is fine. Um, if maybe you um, just started with your company and your current supervisor doesn't know you that well, that's another time where we definitely see people use a previous supervisor. So again, that's fine. Again, using the optional essay, you don't have to write a long essay. You can just include a paragraph that says, hey, I included my previous supervisor and here's why. Um, so no need to kind of beef that up. But um, yeah, we definitely see people do that. I would say the biggest thing to consider is we do not recommend recommendations from faculty members from your undergraduate institution. We want people who've worked with you in a professional setting. So we really want those people who can speak to your leadership potential. Um, yeah, so if possible, I would recommend meeting with your recommendation provider to discuss your goals. Give them a copy of your resume and your essays as well. Talk about strengths you wanna have highlighted or perceived weaknesses that can be addressed. Again, make sure when you're choosing your recommendation provider, make sure this person knows you well, make sure they can provide insight into your work and your leadership potential. Um, we don't care what their title is. <laughs> if they're the CEO, we're not looking at that. We really want the quality of that recommendation. We want someone who can speak to your potential, um, someone who's worked closely with you. We're, we're not looking at the title. So moving on, so quality of your work experience as shown through your resume. So what's just important is the quantity of your work experience is the quality of what you've done during that time. So in your resume, make sure we understand what you've gained from your experience, how you've influenced your organization, tell us about the teams you've worked on, um, people you've managed, and what you've learned from successes and failures. Learning about your professional experience is important to us because it's such a key element to your contribution in the classroom. The variety of our students' professional backgrounds allows students to learn from each other as they work together in the classroom. When you're making your resume, again, quantify your successes. Don't just bullet your job description. We want to hear about your professional achievements. Help us understand the nature of your work, and the level of challenge, again, any supervising you've done, and the progression of responsibility at your positions. Again, we do recommend one page, ideally, maybe two if you have a lot of work experience, but do try to condense it to that one page. Keep it your professional, post-undergraduate, full-time paid work experience. Again, if you have gaps, use the optional essay as a resource for you um, if there's more to tell to that story. All right, essays. So we get a lot of questions on these. So the essay really provides a voice to your application and personalizes your application. So we have three essay prompts this year, which allows you to select the prompt that allows your personal brand to shine through most. So take some time to reflect on your goals and your past professional progression before drafting your essays and select the option that best highlights your value proposition. And really do remember, this is your chance to tell us why you're unique and tell us your voice. So you have three options, like I mentioned. The first one is talking about a time when you were pushed outside of your comfort zone. Option two is about a time when failure was your fuel to succeed. And option three is talking about your personal brand. So what you will bring to the business school um, and, and how, that, how that demonstrates your personal brand. 
So again, take some time to reflect on the story you want to share with us when you're picking that option. Um, we hope it gives you more flexibility. Um, we definitely want to help meet your needs and give you options. Um, certainly not everyone's story could be told with the same prompt. So hopefully you like that option um, to have the different essays. Make sure when you write your essay, no matter the prompt, that you edit, you proofread, and you answer the question. Use spell check. Make sure you use the correct MBA program's name in the essay. It sounds silly, but it does happen every year. So check that out. Make sure Georgetown McDonough is um, coming through. <laughs> we also have a video essay. So again, a lot of questions on that. So the prompt is to introduce yourself to your cohort in one minute or less. I strongly encourage you to speak outside of the experiences listed on your resume. We've seen your work experience. We know what you do. So tell us something outside of that. Um, and we do ask that you appear in person and part of your video. So a few notes on that. Um, we don't expect you all to be video editors. We certainly understand that. So we have seen great essays, um, just your computer, your phone set up, um, people just sitting at their desks, maybe on their sofa, something like that, and just telling us a, a good story about themselves. So we don't expect anything flashy. If you have the capability to do that, certainly go for it if you're gonna have fun with it, but don't stress. We don't expect you to all be um, professional YouTubers or anything like that. <laughs> so no worries. Um, we do recommend we have kind of the privacy settings that you should follow um, so they are private. We have all of that. We have a great guide for you on our website. So again, if you feel like being flashy, if you feel like really running with it, go for it. We certainly won't hold you back, but we also don't expect you um, to be making anything crazy. So we've seen great ones just filmed in front of your computer. So don't stress about it. In terms of the video essay and the written essays, do be strategic and intentional about what you share with the admissions committee. Have a family member, a friend, read or view your essay. Make sure it sounds like you. Make sure the reader connects with you on a personal level. And don't just tell us what you think you want to hear. Don't tell us what's on our website. We really want to get to know you and your personality and make sure this is the right fit for you. We've talked about the optional essay, but do use it if you need to, but please don't feel obligated. We use it to fill in any gaps, make any connections that we might not get from the application in other places. But um, you, know, you don't wanna leave us guessing, but certainly don't feel obligated to use it. You don't have to. Um, it really is for additional information that is not covered in your application. Um, it's not a chance to just write another essay for the sake of writing another essay. So next up, so let's talk about the interview. All right, so the interview determines mutual fit. So certainly you're assessing um, our program. You're still considering which option you want to go with, and we're making sure that you're the right fit for our program as well. So the interview is, interviewer is considering you from three different perspectives. So first of all, the faculty. So considering, will this person add to the classroom conversation? We're looking at you from a recruiter perspective. So will this person be able to secure an internship and a post-MBA career? And then from a student perspective, so is this someone I want on my team working together long hours and in my network post MBA? So prepare for the interview as you would a job interview, research the school, try to think of questions you might be asked, such as why is now the right time for you to get an MBA at Georgetown McDonough? Practice telling your story to friends and family. And again, this is your chance to give your application a voice. So relax, be yourself. It's a conversation. It's a 30 minute interview with a um, student, uh, an alumni, a staff member, um, or another community member. So really, um, we're trying to get to know you. We truly are. And just trying to make sure the program is a good fit for you. So that's it. Just like that, of course, you're done. You get to click submit. Um, sounds so easy, doesn't it? So after you submit your application, celebrate. It's a lot of work. You're pulling a lot of pieces together. You're certainly applying most likely to more than one program. So it's a lot. So take a second to breathe, enjoy the process, um, and celebrate. On our end, that's where the work kicks off. So that's where we get excited. We get to know you guys better, and it's a lot of fun on our end. So first of all, what we do is we have our operations team take a look at your application and make sure it's complete. 
So certainly there are a lot of pieces. If you are missing something, we'll reach out to you, get in touch with you. Coolies, don't worry. Um, it's our job to make sure that your application is complete, get everything submitted. So we're there to work with you. So there's no reason to stress out about it. Just you respond to our emails, get us the information, stay in touch with us. Um, we'll, we'll work with you to get that submitted and move it on to the admissions committee. You'll be able to log into your online application account and check the status and view exactly what items are missing, um, whether it's maybe your name on your transcripts, something small, um, or maybe uh, an upload didn't go through, and maybe we're missing your test score. Again, please don't worry. It happens all the time, so no need to stress about it. We'll work with you to figure it out. As we will start viewing um, applications, we will start sending out invitations to interview with a member of our community. Again, we have student interviewers, our colleagues in the program office, career center, um, our staff, certainly, and then alumni as well. So invitations to interview with our team go out right up to the decision notification date. So decision notification dates are published on our website. You know exactly when to expect that. So invitations really do come out that entire time. It's all a part of our review process. There's no um, kind of hidden message between when you get your invitation. It's all just how it goes to the readers. Um, we really are reviewing applications many, many times throughout that process. So um, it can really come at any time. So yes, yeah, so we're reviewing those applications. Multiple people have eyes on your file. Um, you're evaluated against the other people in the applicant pool. And again, decisions will be released on the decision notification date for your round. If you are admitted, you'll have about six to eight weeks to make a decision and ultimately submit a deposit. At that point, we turn things over to you. It's your turn to make a decision at that point. So this is our class profile. These numbers are actually from last year. Um, we're still working on finishing up our class profile now. We should have new numbers for you very, very soon. Um, every year our numbers get better and better. We're really proud of the classes that we're bringing in at Georgetown McDonough. Our numbers are strong. Um, and again, our profiles are online, so you can check those out. The important thing to remember, um, the numbers are not minimum, so you might fall above one average and below another. Um, there's no magic formula on how you get in. Um, so just remember, beyond those numbers, uh, we're looking at the qualities that we seek. So we want critical thinkers with an executive presence for driven, motivated, and professionally accomplished individuals. We have information about funding your MBA, so the tuition numbers that there, again, they're on our website as well. We award scholarships um, based on an applicant's academic, personal, and professional accomplishments. So they are merit-based scholarships as opposed to need-based. Um, recipients demonstrate ethical leadership and their professional accomplishments through their application and interview for the MBA program. Typically, these people also have shown a commitment to service and commitment to others through their past and current activities. All applicants, both full-time and flex MBA applicants, are automatically considered for these merit-based scholarships, so you do not need to submit any additional materials to be considered. We're proud to partner with the organizations listed below um, to offer scholarships to specialty populations. We partner with a lot of great organizations, so definitely check them out. There's a lot of information, again, on our website. Um, I'm sure you've heard of some of them, Forte Foundation, the Consortium for Spanica, um, but really proud to partner with these organizations, so check out our website if you're not familiar um, and learn more about them. U.S. citizens and permanent residents can also be considered for federally funded programs, so federal financial aid. Once you're admitted, the Office of Student Financial Services will assist qualified applicants with meeting their educational and living costs with need-based financial aid through the form of loans. I would recommend, um, oh, actually, well, here, let's talk about the application deadlines. <laughs> So there are four rounds of admission. Um, if you are interested in being considered and kind of most competitive for merit-based scholarships, we recommend that you apply no later than round two. So there's just more funding available in rounds one and two. So do try to prioritize those rounds if scholarship funding is important to you. For international students, we also encourage you to apply by round two, just to make sure you have sufficient time to secure a student visa after being admitted. It can take some time. For some countries, it doesn't take quite as long as others. Um, but we do recommend that you apply for that visa as soon as possible. So if you apply in rounds one and two, you're really just best positioning yourself to make sure you have plenty, plenty of time to secure that visa before you have to be on campus um, in late July, early August. 
ultimately the biggest thing to take away from this is that we recommend that you apply in the round when your application is the strongest. So don't rush to submit your application if you feel like you need more time. I would say if you can't decide what to do, the best thing is to call our office, email us. Again, this is where we're here to work with you. Um, if you're taking your GMAT on October 1st and you still wanna be in round one, have a conversation with us, um, that's fine. We have that happen all the time. So definitely again, um, communicate with us. That's the best thing you can do. We're here, we're happy to answer the phone and talk to you and help you figure out what's best to do for you. Finally, ways to get in touch with us. So again, email us, call us. There's a lot of ways to get in touch with us. We're happy to help at any time. Hopefully this is not the last time you connect with us. So we have a lot of great on-campus programs. We also travel. Um, our team is all over the world right now. Um, so we're around, we're happy to connect. We offer a great program experience, Georgetown, that's led by our student ambassador. So it's a way to um, attend class with the current student. And then you also get to have a coffee chat where you meet a lot of other students. Um, and there's a brief information session as well. So great opportunity to visit campus, get a real good feel for the fit of the program. I would recommend, um, it's really great to visit the programs that you're applying to if you can. Some people do it before they apply, some people do it after, um, some people loop it into their interview, kind of do it all at once. So again, um, do what's best for you. Um, hopefully we offer a lot of options, sometimes we're even in the city is where you are. So hopefully a lot of ways to connect. And then certainly if you want to talk to a current student, again, we have our student ambassadors. Um, so they're around to give you a student perspective as well. So they'll be back on campus um, and working in our office again in the next couple of weeks. So pretty soon here, they'll be back in action and ready to talk to you. So with that, let me turn the table. So let me, I can see we are getting questions already. I love it. So let's start working through them. Feel free to send them in. Um, I'll start at the top and we'll go from there. All right, so first question. Um, so asking about a specific GMAT score and how that affects an applicant. So again, GMAT score, that's not where you want it. Um, certainly remember that the averages are just averages. We offer that range. So you know there are people above it, people below it. So definitely keep that in mind. The GMAT is one point, one part of your application. We're looking at everything in conjunction. So, um, you know, there isn't a magic formula. We can't say, for this specific population, you need to have this GMAT score. Um, so I'd say check out our class profile, look at the ranges, and you can best see how competitive you would be. A question about, can we apply with the GMAT scores if the AWA scores are weighted? Yes, you can. So in that case, submit the scores that you have, um, submit the PDF for a screenshot of the scores that you have, and then when you get the AWA, um, sometimes I know the writing score also takes some time. Um, so actually with the GMAT, you get your unofficial score the day that you take the exam. You can submit that. And then once you get the further information, just email our office um, or you can upload that directly to your application. Question about the quantitative classes that you submit on your application. So if you have a lot, that's awesome. Um, how do you choose which ones to report? Um, I would recommend the ones that you did the best at. So I would say the highest grades um, and the ones that are most applicable to a MBA program. So maybe finance, accounting, um, I would say highlighting those is the best thing to do. We're still gonna look at your transcripts. So if you have a lot more beyond that, we will obviously look at that and see that. Um, this is just a place to highlight those, the best ones, I would say. Um, so we do see people, certainly if you are a finance major, you're gonna have a lot of classes to report. So that's fine. Um, and again, we will look at your transcripts still. So I would say highlight the best ones, pick your favorites. Um, we'll still look at your transcript and see the rest. Question about how are the GRE scores converted? So when we are reviewing the scores, we do not convert the scores. Um, ETS offers a conversion tool that can be helpful. I would say I would use that for your purposes um, to just to see how you compare to the class profile. But we're looking at the percentiles of the GRE section, so the verbal and the quantitative. Um, we're looking at the percentiles. A question about if you've applied to law school and would like to get your MBA as well, um, do you still have to take the GRE or GMAT? So yes, you do still have to submit a GRE or a GMAT score, um, even if you are a dual degree candidate. 
Is there a maximum number of years of work experience? Um, so again, there's really no limits. There's no minimum, there's no maximum. I would say our executive MBA program typically takes people with about 10 years of post undergraduate full-time work experience. So I think the question for you would be looking at the two programs, the executive MBA program and the full-time MBA program, or I guess flex MBA program, um, and deciding which program is the best fit for you. So that's a great time, again, talking to us, um, trying to figure out which experience you want and figuring out which option would be the best in your individual case if you're on the higher end of that work experience range. A question about if you held full-time paid positions for work during your undergraduate career, can you consider those as full-time paid positions of post-undergraduate work? So in the actual um, total number that you will calculate, no, um, you only consider post-undergraduate work experience. In terms of the admissions committee reviewing your resume and considering that work experience, we certainly would look at that. So I would say include it on your resume, um, we'll look at that. But in terms of calculating that actual number of post-undergraduate work experience, we would not consider that. Yeah, so is it possible, okay, great question. Is it possible to submit more than one recommendation? So if you are going to submit more than one recommendation, I would strongly encourage you to make sure that it provides a different perspective on your candidacy. Um, we really only want one recommendation. If you are going to submit another one, again, make sure it's really giving a different look at your application, um, and making sure it's providing a different perspective. You can submit another, it's actually in the application itself, but I strongly encourage you to keep it to one um, unless you think it can really provide an additional element to your application. A question about, um, yeah, certainly if you're considering about working until the start of the MBA program, would you consider those months in your work, work experience total? Yes, you would. Question about, my university does not have a grade scale um, every university has a way of assessing their grades, um, so your university most likely does have a grade scale. I would say contact the registrar's office and ask them to give you information about it. Um, every school has a way of grading their classes and has kind of a formula for that or has some type of documentation. Um, I've never come across a university that didn't have a grade scale. So um, if that is the case, that's certainly a first that I've seen in my seven years of working in higher education. Um, and in that case, I would want a letter from the university saying we do not have a grade scale. Question about a mentor or a client as a recommendation provider. Yeah, so again, if that's one of those situations where you cannot tell your current supervisor that you are applying to an MBA program, we definitely get people in that situation where they don't want to hurt their chances for a promotion or a raise or something like that. Um, yeah, I would say a mentor or a client is good. As long as they can really speak to your professional potential, um, I'd say that's the most important thing. Um, really making sure they know you as a leader, as a professional, um, maybe not someone who's known you since you were a kid. <laughs> um, uh, really talking about your professional potential is really the most important thing. A question about is Zoom or Skype an option for interviews? Yeah, so we actually use Zoom, um, which is the program we're using right now. So we do offer those options, virtual options for the interviews. Um, if you can't travel to campus, we definitely understand that. They're all reviewed the same way. Um, so whether it's on campus, virtual, or maybe we, tra we, well, we do travel as well, so if it's in person in a different city, um, you won't be dinged or anything um, if you do a virtual interview. You know, your schedules are crazy, you guys have a lot of things to balance from a personal life perspective. Um, you all work very hard, um, so yeah, if you need to do a virtual option, please go for it. We have a lot of options for you, so do the one that's best for you. Yeah, so a question about the consortium. So if you're applying through the consortium, you can completely ignore our application deadlines. You're only looking at the consortium application deadlines. So um, disregard everything I just said about application deadlines, and you can just look at the consortium. So if you haven't looked at the consortium, it's a great um, organization. We're so proud to be a member of it, um, and they work um, on kind of increasing diversity in the business world. So I'd say check them out. They have a really great opportunity to apply to a lot of programs. Um, again, so proud to be a member of that organization. We love it. Um, so yeah, you'll just pay attention to their deadlines. Uh, 
All right, so a question about what is the difference between full-time MBA and flex MBA when it comes to the profiles and career goals? Um, I would say in terms of career goals and, and profiles, they're pretty similar. Um, both, I, I, the biggest thing when you're considering the different programs is the experience that you want out of them. So do you want that full-time experience where you pull yourself out of the workforce for two years? Or do you want to stay um, working for those three years in the district area um, and, and continue kind of down that path as you pursue your MBA? Um, if I apply for the Flex MBA, will I automatically be considered for full-time MBA? No. So if you want to apply for both programs, you have to apply separately. Again, that's a time where I would say talk with our office. Um, you do have to apply to both programs. You have to submit two applications um, for, for both. Um, so, so no, you will not automatically be considered. Question about um, submitting two scores um, for the GRE, do we look at the highest combined score or the highest writing score? Um, so we'll look at, um, typically we look at the score of the highest quantitative percentile. If you're submitting all of your scores, and this goes for both GMAT and GRE, we'll look at all of them. Um, so if you, there was a time where maybe you took the either GRE or GMAT and you did better um, in one percentile, we'll see that. So we really look at everything that you give us. Um, if you only give us one score, that's all we'll have. But yeah, if you submit several scores, we'll look at everything. So a question about applying in the rounds. So if you apply in round one, do you have a better opportunity? Um, so I would say, you know, certainly in round one, there are more places available. We admit um, very strategically knowing that we will have amazing candidates coming in rounds two, three, and four. So I would say, um, you know, certainly there's more funding available in round one, but really do apply for the round that's best for you when your application is strongest. If you do apply in round one and let's say you were denied, you would have to wait until the next application cycle to apply. So then you would be applying um, for fall 2021 at that point. A question about, can you submit your application without test scores um, if they've not been taken by the application deadline? So it all depends on when you're taking the test. So if you are taking, let's say for the September 30th deadline, if you're taking the test on October 5th, um, in that case, we could likely still loop you into round one. If you're not taking the test at that point until December, that's a different conversation. So the most important thing is to tell us the test date, um, make sure you have it scheduled. Again, communicate with our office, that's the best thing to do email our office, give us a call and we can help you with that. I would say, um, you know, if it's very soon after the deadline, we can work with you. If it's going to be a long time, I would just wait to submit your application. The question about um, switching your job several times since graduating from undergrad, is that a concern? Would that merit an optional essay? Um, I would say it kind of depends on your situation. Um, you know, if, you, if you've switched many, many times and you haven't graduated that long ago, you might want to use the optional essay. If there's kind of more to that story, definitely use it there. Um, if maybe there's some reason why you left your jobs, um, I would definitely use it there. There is a place in the application to note why you left the job, um, and certainly we'd get that from your interview as well. Um, so again, just don't leave us guessing. If there's more to tell in that story, definitely let us know. If you're applying for the consortium, a question about how many recommendations, um, you would follow their guidelines. So I actually don't know off the top of my head how many recommendations they ask you to submit. I actually think they do ask you to submit two. Um, so follow the, uh, the consortium's guidelines, follow their application instructions in terms of the requirements. A question about making yourself stand out and making yourself um, appear unique in your essay if you come from a quote traditional business background. Um, yeah, I would say there really is no traditional business background at this point when you're coming to apply to MBA programs. So um, I, I think you already will stand out. Um, so just tell us your story and in that way that will be unique. Um, even if you are coming from consulting, we get people from every kind of industry and that's what makes our job so fun. Um, so just by telling your story, um, they're being who you you are, you will appear unique. Um, so I would say don't, don't worry about that. You'll definitely come across as unique and interesting. 
A question about converting your grade scale to a GPA. So we actually do not want you to uh, convert your grade scale to a GPA. So um, if you are an international student or maybe you just have went to an institution with a non-traditional GPA, that's why we ask you to submit your grade scale so we can compare your grades based off of your grade scale. So do not convert anything. Um, give us your grade scale and we'll review it as it is. A question about, um, so if you maybe um, took AP coursework in high school and you tested out of your undergraduate quantitative coursework, how was that viewed? Um, so certainly would view that, um, you know, we want to see quantitative background, um, whether it's through your undergraduate career um, or maybe through your work experience. So I would say just highlighting your quantitative successes in other ways is great in that sense. Um, so whether it is taking an online Coursera course, um, the online MBA math program, or just through your test scores, um, I'd say it kind of depends. Again, we're looking at everything. We're looking at the full suite of things that you submit. Um, so it kind of depends on the overall story. You know, certainly it just doesn't come down to one um, calc class in undergrad. So question about the Flex MBA, do I need to be working in order to get into the MBA? So ideally the Flex MBA is for people who are working um, already in the uh, DC metro area, I would say. Um, some people are given the opportunity um, to work remotely or maybe transition to the DC area through their company. Um, so we do see applications come outside of the DC area, but the intention is that you are working full time throughout the MBA. Um, in terms of career development and job placement support, um, I won't go too far into that since we are focused on the application today, um, but you are offered the same kind of career development and support as um, the full-time MBA. Um, the difference I would say, um, certainly not all of our Flex MBA students are um, completing the MBA recruitment at the end of their career, uh, their MBA career, um, because they're working full time. So some of them want to stay in their position or be promoted. Um, so I'd say it's a slightly different approach um, to the career support, but it is essentially the same services. My question about taking additional courses and completing the MBA um, sooner or is it a fixed two years? For the full-time MBA, it is the full two-year program. Um, for the Flex MBA, we offer more of flexibility, as in its name. Um, so that one you can complete a little bit sooner, but for the traditional full-time MBA, you are looking at the full two years. All right, more questions. This is great, I love it. You guys are on fire today. <laughs> okay, let me go to the top here. All right. Are the GPA and GMAT 80% ranges or 100% ranges? So the GPA and GMAT listed in our class profile are um, the mid 80%. In terms of the GRE ranges, so we do not um, have that on the class profile. Again, I'd recommend using that ETS tool to um, convert your GRE score into a GMAT so you can compare that with our profile. A question about canceling your GMAT score and same with the GRE. Do we see that score? Um, so we don't see the score, we'll just see that you canceled it. So literally on the test report, it has a C for canceled in all of the percentiles. So that's all we see when you cancel your score. All right, so question about the English proficiency exam exemption. So yes, if your transcript says that the medium of instruction is English, that is great documentation. We'll just have you import that to your application um, and that's, that is sufficient. Um, if your transcript doesn't explicitly state the medium of instruction, in that case, we would just want you to get a letter from your institution. Um, typically the registrar can draft that up for you. I think it's a pretty common request um, and you can submit that to your application. It's very important that we have that when you apply um, or very shortly thereafter that we have some type of documentation showing the medium of instruction um, because if we do not have that, we would consider your application incomplete without the English proficiency exam or some type of documentation showing us that you're exempt from it. A question about um, what advice do we have for applicants who haven't had traditional promotions or management experience 
So given more responsibility, but no change in job title or more project management experience instead of managing employees. Yeah, so some people just haven't had that opportunity to manage other people. In that case, we're really looking at your potential. So that's where the recommendation really comes in. Um, having a recommendation provider that can say, maybe he hasn't had this opportunity, but they've led teams or they've led projects and they've done other things, which leads me to believe they will be a great leader for these reasons. Um, so yeah, not everybody will have that. So I think just showing that on your resume, showing um, the progression in your responsibilities is important um, and definitely how you talk about that in the resume. A question about for the video, should you talk to it, um, or I guess speak in the video as though you are directing it towards your peers, not necessarily to admissions. You can do it either way. It's really up to you what you want to do with it. We leave it open. Um, I would say um, think about what you would want to tell your peers, maybe not necessarily the admissions committee. Again, thinking outside of the traditional resume, um, we know where you went to school, we know what you do for a living. Um, so tell us something beyond that. Question about if you submit your application, how long does the recommendation provider have to complete their letter? So ideally we would have a completed application on the application deadline. We do understand that recommendation providers sometimes need more time. So if it comes in shortly thereafter, that's great. But I would encourage you to have them submit it by the deadline if they can. If they cannot, um, you've got a little bit of leeway, but definitely aim for that deadline. If you are at a point though, where um, your application is ready to roll, but the recommendation has not been submitted, go ahead and submit your application. Um, and then when the recommendation gets finished, it'll get matched to your application. So if that's the only thing you're waiting on, go ahead and submit um, and we'll get the recommendation um, as it comes in. A question about opportunities for scholarships in the different rounds, again, Round one, there's more funding available. If it's important to you, I would say rounds one and two are the best option for you. Um, certainly there are people who are awarded scholarship in rounds three and four though. So we, again, we admit knowing that we will have rock stars come in later in the process. So um, apply when you are most confident with your application, but I would prioritize rounds one and two. A question about, is it possible for a flex student to be full-time status um, because of the GI Bill? Um, I would have to check on that, actually. I'm not exactly sure how that works. I would say reach out to our veterans office um, or reach out to our office directly and we can um, help you figure that out. So what are the advantages to submitting in round one? Um, so I would say the biggest advantage is getting your decision sooner. Again, putting yourself in the best position um, for scholarship awards, um, giving yourself plenty of time to prepare, um, get ready for the program. Um, yeah, but definitely, again, I will keep saying it, apply in the round that's best for you. Question, can you take the GRE instead of the GMAT? Yes. Hopefully I've made that very clear throughout this uh, application webinar. You can take both. Question about what advice do we have for Flex MBA applicants, specifically on the essays about moving to DC and retaining employment? How specific should we be with our intended plans? I would say be as specific as you can. Um, if you are planning to move to DC and looking for a job, definitely tell us what companies you want to target. If you already know what your plan is, um, if you're, again, if you're working with your company to relocate, let us know. Um, any information that you have that you can give us, we're happy to have. Um, so the question about um, so the question about scholarships for flex versus full time. A um, little confused by your question, so if you want to um, maybe clarify what you mean by the first part, um, can you sign up for the five year flex program? Uh, yes, you, so yeah, so you can flex the program from about two and a half years up to five years, depending on your schedule. A uh, question about submitting your test scores at a later date after submitting all the other relevant information. Um, yeah, so like I said, if you're going to submit 
uh, I'm sorry, if you're taking your test, GRE, TOEFL, GMAT, whatever it is, um, after the application deadline, again, it really just comes down to when you are taking that test. So for GMAT, you get your test scores that day. For GRE and the TOEFL, I think it takes about 10 to 15 days to get those scores back. So keep that in mind. Um, it'll really just come down to when we can get those scores and that'll kind of determine which round you'll be looped into. So the best thing to do in that case is to communicate with our office and we can help you figure out what to do. Another question about not having a GPA. Again, we do not want you to do a conversion. We ask you to submit your grade scale so we can review your grades as your university grades them. Um, a specific question about kind of pursuing um, with 10 years of experience in a specific industry. Um, again, we want people with a lot of different backgrounds. Um, so if you don't have a traditional background, if you're coming from a non-traditional industry, again, I feel like at this point, there really isn't a traditional industry for the MBA program. So we love it. We love these different backgrounds. It's really going to come down to what you can offer um, to the MBA program, giving us a clear idea of why you want the MBA and what you plan to do with it. Um, that's a more important piece than worrying about exactly what your background is. A question about interviews for the Flex MBA program. So yeah, so interviews are mandatory for the Flex and full-time MBA program. Um, you will be invited to those interviews. Um, yeah, so you would do a Zoom interview. So it's actually the program we're using right now. Um, if you are out of the country or even just not in the area or can't travel to DC. So we have a lot of options for you. Question about would we accept quantitative courses from a community college taken 10 years ago? Yep, definitely. A uh, question about not having, yeah, so I would say um, if you are a current undergraduate, I would say we strongly recommend that people have a minimum of about two years of post undergraduate professional work experience. Um, if you don't have that, I would say definitely highlight the experience that you have had through your resume. Um, we would say the, the work experience is an important piece. Again, it's really what you're bringing to the classroom and what you can give. Um, this is a heavy, you know, it's a general management program. So, um, we really do want people who've had post-undergraduate work experience when they're coming to the program. Yeah, so a question about when the experience Georgetown opportunities will be available. Yeah, so our students just aren't back yet, so that's why we don't have opportunities in August um, and early September. So they'll be back here soon. Um, you know, we have to coordinate a lot of different things with the professors and making sure we have enough seats for you and, and making sure we have students to host. So a lot of moving pieces on our end. We should have those up very soon. The opportunities will run um, pretty much whenever our students are there having class. Um, so that's why we don't have them when our students are gone. So we should have more coming up early September, uh, I would say mid-September all the way through December. Um, you know, you wouldn't want to sit in on a final. <laughs> Certainly would not be very interesting. Um, so that's but we just can't offer them sometimes. So um, they should be up very soon. We're working really hard to get those ready for you. Yeah, so a question about maybe you did not have a quantitative heavy course load in undergrad, but you've used their quantitative skills in your professional experience. That's awesome. So definitely reflect that on your resume. Um, yeah, you could talk about that in your optional essay as well. All really get great ways to highlight your quantitative skills outside of your undergraduate experience. A question about um, if you've graduated and you're not satisfied, satisfied with a grade in a course and you retake that course, um, I would think that would be up to your undergraduate institution. Um, if you're thinking of taking it like at a community college or something like that, um, yeah, we review any transcripts that you give us, so we would look at that. Question about three-year undergraduate degrees from an international institution. So we follow West guidelines. Um, so we just, I would say, reach out to West if there are any questions about whether your degree is equivalent to a um, undergraduate degree. Does the average years of work experience range refer to the experience? Um, so it refers, refers to your experience at the start of the program. So we always go off of July 31st um of the year you'd be starting so july 31st 2020. 
And the question about getting a WES um, evaluation done, if you want to do that, it certainly is um, a great option. If not, you're not required to. Um, just make sure you give us all the um, application materials we asked for in terms of grade scale, um, degree certificate, all of your coursework shown with the grades as well. The question about what, if you want to start the program in 2021, then you would want to apply in the next application cycle. So question about doing a part-time master's program that you did full-time work throughout. Yeah, so that experience definitely would be counted as a part of your total professional work experience. Uh, is there a student ambassador I would recommend? Oh, um, no, I think they're all amazing. I would say reach out to the student ambassador whose background list um, matches yours or uh, their uh, post MBA goals go best align with yours. They're all great. We select them. Um, there's an application process that's pretty competitive to become a student ambassador. So we definitely pick the best and brightest for you. Um, so hopefully we have a really great team for you to interact with. Um, so no, I don't recommend any of them because I recommend all of them. Question about, do we accept enhanced score reports? Yeah, definitely do that. Um, if the unofficial is fine with us, but if you get the enhanced report, sounds good. A question about GPAs from previous grad programs. Are they considered in addition to the undergraduate GPA? Yeah, any additional graduate coursework. Um, whether it's a certificate program, a master's program, whatever it is. Yeah, we definitely look at that. Great question. So if you plan to retake uh, GMAT, again, GRE, TOEFL, any test score, but you're applying in the first round, how does that work? Yeah, so the way it works, so in your application, there's an opportunity to tell us your test date. So make sure you tell us when that is. Um, and then that way we know to expect a new score. When you have your new score, you can actually upload that into your application status and it will be reviewed. Um, so make sure you include that test date so we know to uh, kind of anticipate a new score. Uh, question about specific programs that can help show an improvement in academics and quantitative performance. There are a lot of great programs out there. I know um, this specific question mentions UCLA Extension, MBA Map. We see a lot of those. Um, I'd say it's the one that's best for you. I know there are free options. It's a matter of if you want to pay for one, if you want to do the free option, what you can give us. So we look at any of those. Um, they're great ways to show us your experience outside of undergraduate. A question, I know we're coming to the end, so I'm trying to go as fast as I can here. <laughs> um, I can go a little bit over um, if you wanna hang on um, and we can, let me try to get as many as these as I can. Okay, question about coming from a nonprofit background. Are they successful? Yeah, we see a lot of people who are interested in nonprofits, um, whether it's post MBA or they're coming from a nonprofit background. So definitely, um, yeah, I'd say those people definitely align really well with our mission as well. So they do quite well here. Um, so you're certainly not alone in that. So I'd say you would be a rock star. Can you mark that you're currently enrolled in a four credit online quant course? You definitely can, sounds great. Uh, specific question about transfer credits for the Flex MBA. Yeah, I would say if you have questions about the transfer credits, um, email our office, get in contact with us and we can give you more information. Average TOEFL score. So we do wanna see a minimum of 100 on the TOEFL um, when you are submitting your application. A question about what percent of the total applications are candidates with over 12 years of experience? Uh, I, I don't know that I know the percentage off the top of my head. I'd say typically our range is about two to about eight years is usually the average. Um, 12 plus years we more see more often in the executive MBA program. But again, it depends on which program you are more interested in. So you wouldn't be at a disadvantage. You're just offering even more to the classroom. Um, so it's not quite as common, but um, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the percentage off the top of my head. A question about um, kind of you just recently graduated from undergrad, how will it affect you? Again, the, so the average is about five years, um, but certainly there are some people who are read, ready for the MBA after about two years. There are other people who are not ready until about eight. So it's really about telling your story, telling us the um, impact you've had in that time. Um, it comes down to the person. Um, it's really on an individual level.
Um, question about if you, again, so yeah, if you want to start in 2021, um, really recommend that you apply in the 2021 application cycle. So it would actually be beginning next fall um, in fall 2020. Um, yeah, you'd want to take that in, in, in next year. question about if your current work experience doesn't connect to the MBA, how will that affect you? Um, really the most important thing is, is um, telling us how it will connect, what your goal is post MBA. Um, it really is telling that story. Oh, what is my name again? I'm sorry. Yeah, so my name is Amanda Wainer. I'm an assistant director of MBA admissions. Um, I've been here for seven years, so yeah. Are there summer courses? So for the full-time MBA program, there are no summer courses because our students are completing their internships. For the Flex MBA program, um, we do offer summer courses. Question about degree certificate. Sorry, I'm going as fast as I can. Degree certificate currently being processed. Would it be okay to send it later? Yeah, just let us know that you don't have it yet. Um, let us know when you estimate you will have it. Again, in that case, communicating with us and just giving us as much info as you can. A uh, question about taking community courses versus Coursera. We really look at anything. Um, you know, it's really up to you again what you want to commit to, what you can handle right now um, with everything else that you're juggling, I'm sure. Um, so it's sort of up to you. Graduate assistantships. The graduate assistantships and research assistantships are posted um, during orientation. So you apply for those once you're here on campus. Um, they're typically through the McDonough School of Business, but you can um, get some outside of the School of Business sometimes. Recommendations, again, strongly encourage that's from your direct supervisor. Um, if it is going to be a CFO, make sure they know you really well and can really speak to your potential. Um, we really don't care what their title is. We really want the quality of the recommendation, not necessarily the title. Um, how is experience with startups? I would say how is experience with any specific uh, industry that you ask, um, it, it's giving us variety in the classroom, so we love it. Um, so I'd say just explain your experience, tell us the impact that you've had. I'd say kind of the same thing for someone in a startup and someone who's been working at, you know, like a Deloitte. Um, we want to see the impact, what you've done there, what you, how you've led teams. Um, so really just giving us the best information you can, you can give. A question about when do you get your interview invitation? Again, you can get it at any point from the application deadline all the way up to the decision notification date. Okay, last few and then we'll sign off. So <laughs> let's see. I think I may have answered these already. Yeah, question about the video essay. So should it be more personal hobbies, interests? Yeah, we love it. We love dogs. We love cats. We love pets. We love your hobbies. We love to hear who you are outside of the classroom, outside of your job. Um, tell us something that's not on your resume, who you are, what you do, what you're, where you came from. We love it. So tell us something not on your resume. Yeah, hobbies, interests beyond your career is great. Um, in terms of application fee waivers and reductions, so you can look on our website to see which events what um, qualifies for that. Unfortunately, this one does not, um, but you can get the full list on our website. And a question about if you're already in an MBA program and want to apply to a new MBA program, is the application process the same? Yes, it is. Okay, and we'll stop with this one. So if I had to pick, what would I say is my favorite aspect of the Georgetown MBA program? Not an application program, but it's a great question. I would say our community on campus. So our student ambassadors, all of our students really um, know that there is a tight-knit community um, on campus. It's a really close-knit, no rough elbows. Um, so that's what I love about our community. It's a group of people who really wanna go out and make a difference in the world, make the world a better place. Um, so with that, I would say I hope that you do um, communicate with us further. If you want to connect with our student ambassadors, send us an email. Um, they're listed on the website. They'll be back here in about another week or so. Um, we're so excited to get to know you, see these applications, uh, learn about your background. So thanks for sticking with me today. Um, I know we went a little bit over. I hope I answered your questions. And if not, email us, call us, be in touch with us. We're happy to help at any time. Um, you put a lot of work into these applications and we're really excited to see them. So thank you so much for joining me. Again, if you have any additional questions, let us know. Uh, my name is Amanda. If there's anything I can do to help, definitely let me know. So thank you so much, team. It was great working with you today. Um, and hopefully we'll be in touch soon.